Hello and welcome to this episode of RPG Gamer Top 5s, and this time we're going to list the top RPGs on the Atari 2600. The Atari 2600, originally branded as the Atari Video Computer System, or Atari VCS for short, is a home video game console from Atari, released on September the 11th, 1977, and is credited with popularising the use of microprocessor-based hardware and games stored on ROM cartridges. The 2600 was originally bundled with two joystick controllers, a conjoined pair of paddle controllers, and a game cartridge, initially Combat and later Pac-Man. The Atari VCS launched with nine simple low-resolution games in two kilobyte cartridges. The system found its killer app with its version of Tato's Space Invaders in 1980, and became widely successful, leading to the creation of Activision and other third-party game developers, as well as competition from home console manufacturers Mattel and Coleco. By the end of its primary life cycle, games for the 2600 were using more than four times the ROM of the launch titles, with significantly more advanced visuals and gameplay than the system was designed for, with games such as Pitfall and its scrolling sequel Pitfall 2 The Lost Caverns. Atari invested heavily in two games for the 2600, Pac-Man and E.T. The Extraterrestrial, that became commercial failures and contributed to the video game crash of 1983. The 2600 diminished as the industry recovered as led by Nintendo, so Warner sold off the home console division of Atari to Commodore CEO Jack Trammell. In 1986, the new Atari Corporation under Trammell released a lower cost version of the 2600 and the backwards compatible Atari 7800. Atari finally ended production of the Atari 2600 on January 1st, 1992. Across the system's lifetime, an estimated 30 million units were sold. The 2600 CPU is the MOS Technologies 6507, a version of the 6502 running at 1.19 MHz. Although internally identical to the 6502, the 6507 was cheaper because its package included fewer memory address pins, 13 instead of 16. The designers of the Atari 2600 selected an inexpensive cartridge interface that has one fewer address than the 13 allowed by the 6507 further reducing the already limited addressable memory to 4 kilobytes. This was believed to be sufficient, as combat itself is only 2 kilobytes. Later games circumvented this limitation with bank switching, leading to a maximum supported cartridge size of 32 kilobytes. The console has 128 bytes of RAM for scratch space, the call stack, and the state of the game environment. The 2600 does not have a frame buffer, Instead, the video device provides two 8-pixel bitmap sprites, two 1-pixel missile sprites, a 1-pixel bore, and a 40-pixel playfield that is drawn by writing the bit pattern into each line into a register just before the television scans that line. It could display 160 by 192 pixels and a two-channel mono sound. The Atari 2600 was designed to be compatible with the cathode ray tube television sets that were produced in the late 1970s and early 1980s and uses different color palettes depending on the television signal format. With the NTSC format, a 128 color palette was available, while in PAL only 104 colors, and in CCAM only 8. The 2600 went through several revisions during its life, losing the wonderful wood grain of the VCS versions and becoming an all-black version with fewer switches. Versions were released under the Sears of Video Arcade label, and towards the end of its life, a smaller, cost-reduced form factor with a modernized Atari 7800-like appearance was called the 2600 Junior. But enough of this, and on with the countdown itself. Ah, number 5. Crooks of Chaos by 20th Century Fox in 1982. The background story is that for centuries, the legends of the Crypts of Chaos has been cloaked in mystery. It is said that the crypts are guarded by gruesome and deadly creatures. Though many have entered the creepy crypts in a search of ancient treasure, none have ever returned. But this does not bother one as adventuresome as yourself, especially since you are armed with rare and magical weapons. So go now and be careful, for upon your return we will at last know the secrets of the Crypts of Chaos. Crypts of Chaos is a first-person dungeon crawler on the Atari 2600, something which seems impossible, but the results were absolutely astonishing for 1982. The player starts on the floor of an 18-storey dungeon. The floor depends on the difficulty chosen, with the goal being to get to the bottom floor. Each floor is a maze to navigate, 
and the setup is simple to follow. Monsters attack at random points, with some impressive scaling for the time, and you're equipped with a sword and three magical items that all come to use. Flicking up and down on the joystick chooses between controlling your character and changing items. Certain weapons are required for certain monsters, and it's relatively easy to keep track. Crits of Chaos was one of the most ambitious titles on the Atari 2600. It laid the groundwork for games that are still enjoyed today, like the Wizardry games and the Elder Scrolls titles. At number 4, Raiders of the Lost Ark by Atari in 1982. Raiders of the Lost Ark is an action-adventure game created for the Atari 2600 based on the movie of the same name. The player controls Indiana Jones as he searches for the Lost Ark of the Covenant. The game requires the player to use two different controllers. Controller 2 moves Jones, and its button uses an item. Controller 1 selects the item to use, and its button drops the item. This control scheme anticipated later game controllers with more buttons, and games where buttons would allow players to switch items without interrupting gameplay. The game is set in the city of Cairo in 1936, represented by an entrance room and a marketplace. From the entrance room, the player can blast a hole in the wall with a grenade and enter the Temple of the Ancients. Two paths await inside the temple, both of which contain various dangers, after which the player will at last find the treasure room. Golden artifacts can be picked up in the treasure room, which will help the player later in the game. The player must cross a mesa, on the other side of which lies the map room where the location of the Lost Ark is revealed. South of the map room is a thieves' den and a black market. The black market contains various figures, such as two sheikhs, a tetsi fly and a lunatic, and items needed to win the game, most notably a shovel. After acquiring all needed items from the various rooms, the player returns to the mesa and jumps off using a parachute. The player goes inside the mesa via a small hole at the end of the branch and digs up the ark after dodging more thieves. At number 3, the Sword Quest series by Atari, starting with Earthworld in 1982. Sword Quest is an unfinished series of video games produced by Atari in the 1980s as part of a contest consisting of three finished games, Earthworld, Fireworld and Waterworld, and a planned fourth game, Airworld. Each of the games came with a comic book that explained the plot, as well as containing part of the solution to a major puzzle that had to be solved to win the contest, with a series of prizes on offer whose total value was $150,000. The series had its genesis as a possible sequel to Atari's groundbreaking 1979 title, Adventure, but it developed mythology and system of play that was unique. The comic books were produced by DC Comics, written by Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway, and drawn and inked by George Perez and Dick Gordiano. All three game box covers were illustrated by Atari in-house illustrator Warren Chang. A special fan club offer was provided, allowing those who wanted the game to also get a t-shirt and poster for each game. The games of the Sword Quest series were some of the earliest attempts to combine the narrative and logical elements of the adventure game genre with the Twitch gameplay of the action genre making them some of the very first action-adventure games. However, the last two contests, along with the grand finale contest, were never held, and the final game in the series was not released due to Atari's financial problems related to the video game crash of 1983. Each game of the Sword Quest series was themed after a classical element, earth, fire, water and air. Each game required the player to move through a maze of rooms, collecting objects from one and placing them in other rooms. The arrangement or theme of the rooms varied with each game. Earthworld was themed after the Western Zodiac, Fireworld after the Kabbalah Tree of Life, Waterworld after the Chakras, and with Airworld to have been modelled after the I Ching. Traversing between rooms may require the player to complete a Twitch-style minigame to progress. When the player placed an item in its correct room, they would be presented with numerical clues that referred to a page and panel within the comic that was packaged with the game. There, the player would find a hidden word that was part of the larger Sword Quest contest as by submitting all the correct words in the correct order to Atari, they'll be entered into the next phase of the project. The discovered words would form a relevant phrase towards the larger contest. In at least two cases, for Earthworld and Fireworld, there were more clues indicated by the game than required to be submitted. The players also had to identify a second clue in the game's instruction manual. For Earthworld, indicating prime numbers to use only clues on prime number pages, to know which clues to send in. Fireworld in 1983. 
The games follow twins named Tara and Tor. Their parents were slain by King Tyrannus' guards, prompted by a prophecy by the king's wizard, Conjuro, that the twins would slay Tyrannus. The twins were then raised as commoners by thieves to avoid being slain by the king. When they go to plunder Conjuro's sea keep, they accidentally reveal their identities to him. The twins then start running from a demon summoned to kill them, but it appears that a jewel they stole attracts it. After smashing the stone to avoid the demon, two of Tyrannus' old advisors appear and tell the two about the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery and the Talisman of Penultimate Truth. They are then transported to Earthworld. After defeating the many beasts of the Zodiac and another thief, Herminus, in Earthworld, the twins are transported to the Central Chamber, where the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery and the Talisman of Penultimate Truth are kept. Upon reaching them, the sword burns a hole through its altar all the way to Fireworld. In Fireworld, the twins split up to look for water, and Tor, with the aid of the talisman, summons Mentor, who shows Tor the Chalice of Light, which will quench his thirst. The twins reunite eventually and find the chalice. However, Tor drops it after he is startled, and it is revealed that the one they found was not the true chalice. Terminus then gives them the chalice, and it grows until it becomes large enough to swallow the twins and transports them to Waterworld. Upon reaching Waterworld, the twins become separated. Tara travels to a ship made of ice, somehow forgets her name, and meets Captain Frost, who desires to find the crown of life and rule Waterworld. Meanwhile, Tor travels to an undersea kingdom, forgets his name as well, and meets the city's ex-queen, Aquana, who desires to find the crown of life in order to regain her throne. After a brief war between the ex-queen and the captain, Hermanus sets the twins to duel each other. They then pray to their deities for guidance, which summons Mentor, who allows them to regain their memories. The twins throw down their swords, causing the crown to be revealed and split in half. The halves are given to the ex-queen and the captain, who then rule as equals. The Sword of Ultimate Sorcery then transports the twins to Airworld, where they would have had to do battle with King Tyrannus and Conjuro. While the comic for Airworld was started, the cancellation of the series left the comic unfinished. Waterworld in 1984 Atari had designed the Sword Quest series to award a winner for each of the four games. For each game, they had planned to bring all winners to the Atari headquarters in Sunnyvale, California, to race to complete a specially programmed version of that game to be the first to finish it. The person with the fastest completion would be named the winner and be awarded a treasure produced by Franklin Mint each valued at around $25,000 at the time. The prizes were, for Earthworld, the Talisman of Penultimate Truth, which was an 18 karat solid gold disc studded with 12 diamonds and the birthstones of the 12 zodiac signs, along with a miniature white gold sword set atop it. For Fireworld, it was the Chalice of Light, a goblet made of platinum and gold studded with diamonds, rubies, sapphires, pearls, and green jade. For Waterworld, it was the Crown of Life, a solid gold crown decorated with diamonds, rubies, sapphires and aquamarines. And for Airworld, it was the Philosopher's Stone, a large piece of white jade in an 18 karat gold box encrusted with emeralds, rubies and diamonds. The four winners would have then competed in a final contest to win the ultimate prize, the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery, with a silver blade and 18 karat gold handle covered with diamonds, emeralds, sapphires and rubies that were valued at 50,000 American dollars. For Earthworld, about 5,000 entries were received, but only eight answered correctly. The contest was held in May 1983, with Stephen Bell winning the talisman. For Fireworld, Atari received several more entries, with 73 of these being correct. For practicality, Atari required the 73 finalists to write a brief essay on what they liked about the game selecting the top 50 replies to continue to the final competition, held in January 1984. This was won by Michael Rideout, who was awarded the Chalice. However, at this point in time, Atari had suffered major financial setbacks due to the 1983 video game crash. Atari was further in the midst of dealing with fallout from an insider trading scandal by former CEO Ray Kassar. Kassar was replaced by James J. Morgan in mid-1983, and looking to cut financial losses, eventually cancelled the Sword Quest project, despite work having already started on Airworld. However, because the company had already advertised the availability of the Waterworld contest, Atari's lawyers required the company to continue the contest. To limit the number of entries, Waterworld was only made available to members of the Atari Club. 
The fate of the prizes has been a type of urban legend since the cancellation of the project. Of the five treasures, Rideout has confirmed, as late as 2017, that he still has the chalice in his possession, stored in a safety deposit box. Bell fell out of contact following the Sword Quest event, but according to Vendel and Rideout, Bell appeared to have the disc part of the talisman melted down for its value, about $15,000 at the time, keeping the small sword, diamonds and birthstones. The current fate of these is unknown. The fate of the crown is unknown. Vendel stated that while Atari was required to hold the contest, they could have awarded the winner the cash prize equivalent as opposed to the actual crown. Since they were never part of any contest, the Philosopher's Stone and the sword had seemingly disappeared. Some claimed that Jack Trammell had taken these prizes for himself, based on observations that Atari staff had made of seeing a similar looking sword mounted on Trammell's home mantle. Vendel believed that the persons that started this rumour mistook a Trammell family heirloom for the Sword Quest sword. Vendel argued that it was extremely unlikely that Trammell would have been able to keep the stone, sword and crown, as when Atari was sold, these items would have been the property of Warner Communications until awarded, and would have been returned to the Franklin Mint. Ah, number 2, Secret Quest by Atari in 1989. Secret Quest is an action-adventure game developed by Axlon for the Atari 2600 and published by the Atari Corporation in 1989. The player controls a humanoid character that fights monsters and gathers items on a series of space stations. The game was originally inspired by Nintendo The Legend of Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System, with a final space-themed concept developed and programmed by Steve DeFrisco. Chris DeFrisco was hired to complete the artwork a save game mechanic was incorporated due to the design concept of having lots of locations in an adventure style format. The development team faced data size issues when trying to fit the game onto the cartridge ROM. According to Vintage Games, the game was created as a final attempt to prove the 1977 console could compete with more modern hardware. The cartridge expanded with 256 bytes of RAM and 16 kilobytes of ROM. There are eight huge levels included in Secret Quest. These eight levels are called space stations. The whole idea of the game is to blow up all eight of the space stations to successfully complete the game. But to do that, you first have to find your way through the long mazes and do several other things in order to survive. Somewhere in each level, you will have to find and figure out a detonation code. This detonation code is represented by one, two or more squares in a certain room. To change the symbols in this room, you just have to walk against the barrier at the edge of the room. When you finally discover the correct code, a certain number of seconds will start counting down on the right hand side of the screen. This represents the number of seconds you have left before that level explodes. To escape, you have to find the transporter room and enter the transporter itself to beam yourself out of the level. Instead of just relying on the joystick to control the game, Secret Quest added functions to the switches on the console itself. So when you flip the black and white color switch on the Atari 2600 console, instead of just changing the color, it brings up a few stats, which let you know how well you're doing on your quest. Notable Mention Adventure by Atari in 1979 Adventure is a video game developed by Warren Robinette for the Atari VCS and released in late 1979 by Atari Incorporated. The player controls a square avatar whose quest is to explore an open-ended environment to find the magical chalice and return it to the Golden Castle. The game world is populated by roaming enemies, three dragons that can eat the avatar and a bat that randomly steals and hides items around the game world. Adventure introduced a number of new game elements to console games including a playing area that spans several different screens and enemies that continue to move even when not displayed on the screen. Adventure was conceived as a graphical version of the 1977 text adventure Colossal Cave Adventure. It took Warren Robinette approximately one year to design and code the game, during which time he had to overcome a variety of technical limitations in the Atari 2600 console hardware, as well as difficulties with management within Atari itself. In this game he introduced the first widely known video game Easter Egg, a secret room containing text crediting himself for the game's creation. Adventure received mostly positive reviews at the time of its release and has continued to be viewed positively in the decades since, often named as one of the industry's most influential titles. It is considered the first action-adventure and console fantasy game and inspired other titles in the genres. More than one million cartridges of Adventure were sold 
and the game has been included in numerous Atari 2600 game collections for modern computer hardware. The game's prototype code was used as the basis for the 1979 Superman game, and a planned sequel eventually formed the basis for the Sword Quest games. The Easter egg concept pioneered by the game has transcended video games and entered popular culture. And at number 1, Dragon Stomper by Starpath in 1982. Dragon Stomper was programmed by Stephen Landrum and requires the Starpath Supercharger peripheral, which enhanced the abilities of the console, adding extra memory and higher resolution graphics. Dragon Stomper follows the adventures of a dragon hunter who is given a quest by the king to defeat a dragon and reclaim a magical amulet that was stolen. The player makes his way over the countryside, vanquishing various adversaries and gaining gold and experience. After gaining strength, the player enters a shop in an oppressed village where equipment can be purchased, soldiers hired, and special scrolls obtained to defeat the dragon in its lair. The final leg of the journey traverses the dragon's lair, where he must avoid a series of traps strewn throughout the cave and defeat the dragon. During the first segment of the game, The Wilderness, the player's goal is to either collect enough money or valuables to bribe the town's guard into letting him pass through, or find an identity card that will grant him permission to do so freely. Either way, the overworld is a vast open space littered with castles, huts, churches and other areas that can be explored. Every so often, a random battle will occur, heralded by the opening bars to the Dragnet theme. The player and enemy take turns attacking one another until one or other is dead. If the player expires, accompanied by a faster version of taps being played, a simple hit of the reset switch brings him back to life right where he lies. But with all of his collected gold lost, and his strength and dexterity reset to their normal values. Experience points do not exist in the game, though every so often, items such as staves, potions or magic rings will be found in the spoils of battle, or inside the aforementioned buildings. These items have a random chance of either raising or lowering the player's strength or dexterity. Monsters largely consist of animals, insects and arachnids of various types, as well as human occupations, maniacs, warriors, etc. Some fantasy-themed creatures, like slimes, also exist. Equipment is only available in the form of an axe and a shield which can be found from various locations or monsters. Churches often contain shields. Once the bridge guard permits it, the player can advance into the oppressed village. Three different stores are available to the player there, a hospital, a magic shop and an item store. Items that are no longer needed from the wilderness can be sold for extra gold to buy new, helpful tools. Once the player feels ready, he can enter the Dragon's Cave, which is preceded by a few bars of In the Hall of the Mountain King. The Dragon's Cave is simply one long, narrow hallway, lined by jagged rock protrusions. With no monsters to fight, the primary danger is traps. Two varieties exist, poison darts which fly back and forth in a set line, and invisible floor panels which, when stepped on, trigger an unavoidable burst of flash damage. These panels can be detected with a spell, while the darts can be simply run past. Succeeding in navigating the cave's dangers will result in coming upon a pit in the floor which leads to the dragon itself. The fight with the dragon alternates with the player character and the dragon taking steps towards one another in turns. If the player has recruited any of the soldiers, they march of their own accord up to the dragon to help serve as a distraction and occasionally dealing and being dealt damage. Once the dragon is defeated, it is possible to reach the amulet in its secluded chamber and achieve victory. And that's it for our top 5 RPGs on the Atari 2600. So what did you think? Are we stretching the definition of an RPG to its absolute limits? Or are these the games that launch the genre? Did you own one of these wonderful old consoles? Or is this all ancient history to you? Let us know in the comments below, or by getting in touch through email or the website. So, as always, many thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like what we're doing. But most of all, you look after yourselves. And we'll catch you later. Bye.